This video was brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Get a whole month free at mubi.com slash broeydechanel. On August 6, 2021, a British telecommunications watchdog called Ofcom received a record-breaking number of complaints regarding an incident that occurred on one of the UK's most popular shows, Love Island. The incident in question involved a contestant who had been on the show since the start of the season and the man she paired up with during week two. That night, the contestants were offered a treat from the producers, a movie night where clips of their past and secret indiscretions were played for the rest of the islanders to see, bringing to light potential betrayals. Now this sort of sneaky expose was standard practice for Love Island, a reality dating show where bronze, statuesque singles are trapped in a Spanish villa for 10 weeks under the premise of finding love. The show plays out in real time for five nights a week, and since the contestants have no access to the outside world, the producers have to get a bit creative about drumming up entertainment. So throughout the series, contentious challenges are introduced where contestants have to snog, marry, or pie their fellow islanders, or read malicious tweets about each other, the movie night was an elevated version of an older challenge that had always stirred up a great deal of drama in the villa, but this time, you could tell the atmosphere was tenser than usual. The contestant at the heart of the incident, Faye, had disclosed on multiple occasions that she had suffered heartbreaks in the past and indicated often that her trust in partners was somewhat irreparable. So when the inciting clip showed her partner Teddy disclosing that he was simply attracted to another woman, Faye's growing paranoia boiled over. What seemed to viewers as an otherwise stable and fulfilling relationship quickly devolved into a discomforting, one-sided screaming match wherein Faye yelled at Teddy, a typically soft-spoken person, in front of the entire villa for an uncomfortably long amount of time, threatening to fall out with anyone else who crossed her that night. You might be thinking that these types of emotional outbursts are typical of reality TV, which is maligned by most as a low-culture genre that exploits the worst facets of humanity for entertainment. You're right, this isn't even rare for Love Island, the first two seasons of which have some of the rawest emotional outbursts of the genre. But what led to the record-breaking 25,000 complaints was a tumultuous path ending in three tragic suicides, which has placed Love Island under an unprecedentedly close microscope. While we may have just emerged from the darkness of early to mid noughties reality television, an era which gave us unabashedly gratuitous and exploitative shows like America's Next Top Model, The Anna Nicole Show, or 16 and Pregnant, all of which became famous for their transparent manipulation of vulnerable people, what we seem to be moving towards is an era in which the producers behind said shows have only become better at hiding their tactics. This is not to say that Love Island is an inherently bad show. It's a very good show, actually. The earliest seasons delivered some of the most interesting dynamics I've ever seen on reality TV. With season three being an actual marvel of modern programming, as we watched a group of multifaceted people forge wonderful friendships and fall deeply in love with one another. Nothing like the manufactured nature of other reality dating shows like The Bachelor and its many iterations. But the consequence of this apparent authenticity is an oppressive scrutiny on the behavior of real human beings who are subjected to abuse from the world's most egregious tabloid culture and a watchful public that reads these tabloids. Numerous former contestants have criticized the show for its failure to provide substantial psychological support or any sort of media training that would protect them from abuse. After two contestants, Sophie Graydon and Mike Thelicidis, as well as the show's own host, Caroline Flack, all died by suicide within a year of one another, Love Island has raised very serious questions about the nature of reality TV and its duty of care to the real people who participate in it. Now, I don't want to argue that Love Island is the sole cause of these tragic deaths. But after fellow contestants have come out and said that Sophie, Mike, and Caroline struggled immensely under public scrutiny, 
it would be wrong to dismiss the show and the tabloids' roles in amplifying their duress. Reality TV is an experiment in human behavior. It's easily consumable because we have a natural inclination to watch power exercised on regular people. It feeds upon our basic lust for control. I was rooting for you! We were all rooting for you! How dare you! Learn something from this! Hell, one of the top reality shows of the past two decades is called Big Brother. But what sets Love Island apart from the typical fodder is that the source of power exercised on contestants is invisible. The host is distant, the narrator is omniscient, the games are trivial, and the real game is taboo. Since the powers that punish and reward contestants are invisible and omnipresent, they've produced a phenomenon where contestant behavior has become increasingly sanitized and self-disciplined. It's something that becomes super clear when looking at how the seasons have evolved over the years. This evolution is so palpable that when you compare the latest season with the first, they seem like two completely different shows. After around season six, some viewers have picked up that Love Island has become certifiably boring, more aligned with the stilted fodder of classic reality programming. It's for this reason that Love Island is the ultimate fulfillment of the Panopticon, a system of control which uses subtle forms of surveillance to placate its victims. Love Island's system of surveillance is so effective that over time it's become a detriment to the show's watchability. Contestants are so hyper-aware of themselves being watched from all angles, the producers, the public, their families, that they can no longer deliver the authentic entertainment that's required of truly exciting reality TV. The question is, is this a bad thing? We'll get there eventually. First, some context. <laughs> Reality TV is a tricky genre, associated with what media scholar Misha Kovka characterizes as low production values, high emotions, cheap antics, and questionable ethics because it is an unabashedly commercial form that mixes the serious traditions of documentary with the entertainment purpose of populist formats. It's a form of TV that many would guiltily consume under the covers at night and denounce as trash by day. Whether it's groundbreaking documentary shows like Alan Funt's Candid Camera of the 1940s, or the PBS family drama An American Family of the 1970s, the late 80s blue flashing light American crime shows like Cops, or the British docu-soaps of the mid-90s like Airport and Driving School, or even the inception of a 24-hour news cycle in the early 90s with the O.J. Simpson trial, it's difficult to say when reality TV was first conceived. But Kafka argues that reality TV as we know it today was consolidated among television stations in the late 1980s, as widespread deregulation of the market economy led to greater competition among broadcasters and rising production costs. This meant that broadcasters were forced to find a way to introduce cost-effective programming that would still generate entertainment value. What kind of program required few to no actors or writers, as well as low production values? Well, with the greater availability of affordable camcorders, they were able to create a form of TV which relied heavily on surveillance or camcorder footage and real-life participants, thus cutting the roles of actors and writers, as well as the high budgets required of shows with greater production quality. In Kafka's words, Out of invention and necessity, reality TV was born. While shows like Cops were an early use of the documentary-style camcorder format, it wasn't until 1992 with the release of MTV's The Real World that we'd see today's format of reality shows become popularized. Inspired by youth-oriented dramas like Beverly Hills 90210 and Melrose Place, producers Mary Ellis Bunham and Jonathan Murray wanted to create an unscripted show that would capture the zeitgeist of young people at the time. In came The Real World, a show which brings together a group of strangers from disparate backgrounds into one house and follows their antics as they navigate life with each other over the course of several months. While the show has become notorious for its debauchery, it originally began as a thoughtful experiment in identity and cross-cultural understanding. Early seasons touched on a number of important social issues and were groundbreaking in bringing difficult subjects to mainstream attention. Everything from the Black experience in contemporary America to the realities of living with AIDS were covered in these seasons. The real world shifted TV as we know it, with its emphasis on truth and its popularization of the first-person confessional, where a participant sits down privately in front of the camera and discloses their true feelings. It also invisibilized production, hiding the apparatuses of the camera and screen to create a fourth wall. When asked about this, Jonathan Murray said, You don't want the cast to be constantly reminded they're on a television show. It was a concerted effort to heighten the seeming authenticity of the show's events. 
Scholar Amanda Ann Klein argues that producers of the real world would create an artificial social environment where participants were reminded of how well they are being perceived at all times. A former cast member told Klein that even something as simple as going to the grocery store would be prey to this dynamic. If the cameras decided to follow the person you were with instead of you, you would have no way of knowing if they were simply following that person, or if it was a way of telling you that you weren't generating enough excitement. Klein says, The real world was teaching viewers how to be interesting enough to cultivate a monetizable identity. So this was the first time we'd see how identities were re-stratified and regulated under what is marketable. The real world gave rise to a host of major shows. Jersey Shore, Big Brother, Survivor, and many more which are concerned with placing disparate individuals into one space and observing their interactions like lab rats, typically through surveillance footage. It's safe to say that early 2000s reality TV was straight up depraved. The personalities had become bigger, identities less diverse, and emotionally charged confrontations were at an all-time high. But this depravity declined a bit in the 2010s, and it was in this time, 2015 to be exact, that Love Island emerged to humble beginnings. Now, 2015 Love Island wasn't created from scratch. It's a reboot of an earlier show called Celebrity Love Island, which aired in 2005 and lasted only two seasons. This early version featured B-list celebrities shacked up in a tropical villa in Fiji, where they have to couple up and pull on public heartstrings in an effort to win a 50,000 pound prize. But it was canceled due to low ratings, and it would be almost a decade until whispers of a revival series began to catch wind. This new series would be hosted by TV presenter Caroline Flack, and this time it would take place on the Spanish island of Mallorca over the course of 10 weeks, with the biggest change being that regular people would be cast instead of celebrities. The premise is this. A group of people are thrown into a luxurious, heinously gaudy villa and tasked with forging genuine romantic relationships with one another in the race to win 50,000 pounds. Each week, there are raunchy challenges which amount to little more than a romantic night in a private hideaway, and eliminations that range anywhere from a public vote for your favorite islander or couple to ceremonies where the islanders themselves must eject their own friends. Public votes take place on a specific Love Island app now, a late capitalist fever dream that requires an entire video on its own. The show distinguished itself from the get-go with its narration, an endless string of self-aware punchlines aimed at the contestants and even the narrator himself, comedian Ian Sterling. Sterling's cutting commentary is a welcome satire to the otherwise self-serious dating shows of the US, which can often be simultaneously earnest and mind-numbingly contrived. The UK contestants are loud, crass, horny, and even sometimes witty, and the show makes no effort to sell any sob stories, or force any classic romance narratives. Hell, a major reason the US version of Love Island was such a flop is because American television's prudish broadcasting regulations prevent sex and swearing from the screen, leading to what its producer called artful bleeping. And even then, the American contestants could not scrub together enough personality to make their iteration appear any different from Bachelor in Paradise. From the lovably unhinged relationship between Hannah and John, to Jess's slow-burning underdog story, to Camilla's incredible and unique journey to finding a soulmate in Jamie Jewett, to Kem and Chris's touching friendship, to Amber's redemption arc, to Theo and Ovi being iconic in their own separate ways, to this. Cash. Cash. His surname is... Hughes. <laughs> Why am I crying? Why am I crying? It's because I care about the baby. Oh my God, I'm... what he's got into me. Sorry, Cash, I didn't want you to see that. There are so many moments in the show that feel so tender and real, and that's what makes it compelling. That's what draws people in each night. As Sterling told GQ, you can only make fun of something for being bad if it's actually quite good. Like any reality show, Love Island has had its fair share of drama. There are a ton of disputes and heartbreaks which are classic to this genre. But in certain seasons, the conflicts are often difficult to watch. For example, in season two, contestant Zara Holland, who was the incumbent Miss Great Britain, had her title taken away from her while she was still living in the villa after she had sex with another contestant. What made this all the more upsetting was that Zara had been struggling on the show to begin with, finding great difficulty in socializing with the male contestants. She was also incredibly proud of her title, and the show even had an ongoing joke about how often she brought up Miss GB in conversation. 
Jess Hayes from season one endured endless misogynistic attacks from her fellow contestants, with one newcomer joining the show just to give Jess a mouthful about how her behavior, what would now be regarded as unabashed sexual agency, was a disgrace. Seasons two and three are difficult to rewatch with the knowledge that both Sophie and Mike took their own lives. Sophie's struggles near the end of season two were so upsetting that I personally was unable to finish it. After Caroline Flack's untimely death in 2020, which was partly triggered by a ruthless barrage of tabloid attacks focused on an incident in her personal life that became widely publicized, many, including Zara Holland, called for Love Island to be canceled, citing that the Jeremy Kyle show had recently been canceled after only one participant's suicide. Holland said, You think you're on a summer holiday and you might find love, but you're in a posh prison where you don't know what time it is and a voice in a wall tells you what to do. That show screwed me up. I blame it for everything. What it does to the contestants is terrible. Holland has asserted that she was given laughably minimal psychological evaluation before entering the show. With this information now public, Love Island introduced new welfare measures as of 2021. Now, contestants are taught to deal with the negative aspects of social media, given comprehensive psychological support, a minimum of eight therapy sessions after leaving the villa, full disclosure about the implications of being on the show, and a 12-month period of proactive contact with the show after their departure. Yet somewhere in this evolution to becoming a more nurturing show, something seems to be happening to Love Island. A fracture, if you will, in the very fibers of its watchability. In his seminal 1979 book, Discipline and Punish, French philosopher Michel Foucault, otherwise known as Daddy, created a metaphor for what he saw to be a society dominated by surveillance. He uses Jeremy Bentham, yes, the guy whose embalmed body and poorly preserved head loom over students at the University College London's plan for a structure which, back in 1785, innovated prison architecture. The structure, a circular building which places inmates around the periphery and a guard tower at the center, was called the Panopticon. Pan meaning all and opticon meaning visual. According to Foucault, the panopticon represents a major transformation in state power. Rather than the explicit and public form of discipline exercised by, say, monarchs, the panopticon's power is invisible. Inmates are permanently in view of the guard tower and have no way of knowing if a guard is even in it at all. And this is the central mechanism of power. Because a guard does not have to be in the tower, the inmates must assume he's always there, and thus begin to regulate their own behavior in accordance with that assumption. As Foucault says, he who is subjected to a field of visibility, and who knows it, assumes responsibility for the constraints of power. He makes them place spontaneously upon himself. He inscribes in himself the power relation in which he simultaneously plays both roles. He becomes the principle of his own subjection. Over the years, many scholars have used the panopticon to critique contemporary society, and one of the most prominent fields of this scholarship is in communication studies, particularly with regards to reality TV. I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? A group of people confined to a space with no access to the outside world, with cameras surrounding them recording their every movement? Big Brother certainly picked up on that element early, Borrowing its name from the oppressive dictator in George Orwell's dystopian classic, 1984, Big Brother uses Orwell's concerns about totalitarian surveillance to embark on an experiment where humans are surveilled, consensually, for entertainment purposes. But while Big Brother may seem like the perfect realization of Foucault's panopticon, it's actually akin more to something like, I don't know, the Stanford Prison Experiment than a sleek commentary on surveillance. This is why. The guard, or the surveillance apparatus in Big Brother, is explicit to the contestants at all time. On Big Brother, the contestants are aware of the game they're taking part in. They are active players, agents of their own roles in the house. They are explicitly rewarded and punished, they strategize explicitly. The purveyor of power is known to them and plays an active role in their successes or demise. In his essay, Here's Looking at You, Reality TV, Big Brother, and Foucault, scholar James Wong argues, the contestants on these programs do not, for the most part, monitor or modify their behavior. One contestant in a Big Brother spinoff in the UK, for example, advised applicants for future shows to refrain from relations with other contestants and to be as polite as possible to them. This hardly constitutes the kind of policing of one's own behavior in 1984 or in Foucault's discussion of the panopticon. 
Indeed, reality TV shows want the exact opposite of self-monitoring from the contestants. They want the participants' raw reactions, warts and all. Nor do the producers of reality TV shows want their audience to scrutinize their viewing habits. That might lead individuals to stop watching these programs once they recognize their self-debasement. Yet while this may be true for shows like Big Brother, I argue that Love Island's progression over the years actually contradicts the idea that reality shows don't encourage self-monitoring. In fact, what was once a show that mirrored earlier reality television, highlighting emotional breakdowns, unfiltered vocabulary, explicit intimacy, and the like, has now become subdued. Love Island is the true realization of Foucault's panopticon. Similar to Big Brother, the Love Island villa is home to 73 cameras which capture the islanders at every angle. The islanders have no conception of time and no access to the outside world except in the case of an emergency. But the crucial difference is this. In order to maintain the appearance of authenticity that we love so much about Love Island, the mechanisms of control need to be subtle and invisible. Because they're being filmed at all hours of the day, unable to talk about the rules of the game and unable to predict public opinion, the Islanders begin to regulate themselves under the assumed expectations of what is needed from them. This is in part a result of increased scrutiny over the years, and in part a result of contestants self-regulating under a surveillance system which is now at the height of its power. But it's important to note right now that these two things, public criticism and Love Island's surveillance system, are not mutually exclusive. The sinister beauty of Love Island is in the fact that there is no one source of power over the Islanders. As Foucault says, Power has its principle not so much in a person, as in a certain concerted distribution of bodies, surfaces, lights, gazes, in an arrangement whose internal mechanisms produce the relation in which individuals are caught up. Any individual taken almost at random can operate the machine, in the absence of the director, his family, his friends, his visitors, even his servants. On Love Island, power is decentralized. It oscillates between the producers, the public, the watchful eyes of parents, and even other contestants themselves. So let's explore a few ways that these subtle mechanisms of control contribute to the increased self-regulation of Islanders and to the show's evolution towards blandness. Love Island contestants have no way of knowing which of their actions will be shown on TV and which won't. They therefore assume the guard is always there and operate accordingly. In earlier seasons, this was less understood by contestants. For example, Zoe Bazia Brown of season one and her partner Jordan had sex in the bathroom during their stay in the hideaway with the expectation that their tryst would be private since they weren't on camera. But nonetheless, a painstakingly long scene is shown where the camera lingers on the bathroom door with Zoe and Jordan's mics turned up to full volume for all to hear. This moment was mentioned to Zoe during her exit interview, taking her completely off guard and leaving her mortified. In season two, 19-year-old latecomer Emma Woodham is shown asking a fellow Islander if producers can legally show an intimate scene if it isn't under the covers. Receiving no straight answer, she promptly heads to bed and does the deed with her partner Terry over the sheets in full view of all the other Islanders. Of course, this entire moment was shown on television. In later seasons, sex becomes much less prominent on the show. While earlier seasons would show full montages of every couple heavy petting under the sheets right next to each other, any brief moment that even signifies the sexual act now draws a great amount of shock from viewers. Previously, the hideaway was available to the Islanders at all times, for whichever couple felt like it was the right time to consummate their relationship. Now, it's a privilege that you have to earn. And in the latest season, couples who entered the hideaway spent more time wearing costumes and engaging in the sanitized posturing you'd see in a PG-13 Hollywood movie than actually sharing an intimate moment with each other. I mean, they literally keep the fluorescent lights on. Now, I'm not saying this evolution is necessarily a bad thing. Families of the contestants watch the show regularly, and sex is something that can be incredibly personal and private. In the case of seasons one and two, where intimacy was quite prominent, women were often punished more severely both within the show and outside of it. Think back to Zara losing her entire job on top of being shamed by her closest friends in the villa. So the move towards more sanitized portrayal of sex protects the contestants from public shaming, but it also demonstrates the necessity to regulate themselves under a sexuality that is safe and acceptable for TV, a more marketable sexuality. An interesting side note, heterosexuality on Love Island is almost compulsory, with the producers calling queer couplings a logistical nightmare. Just some food for thought. <music> Love 
What's primary to Love Island, less so than others of its ilk, is that the central game of the show, the race to win 50,000 pounds, is completely taboo in the villa. Mere mentions of the money within the house spark outrage from the contestants. The idea is to forget you're on camera in the process of being immersed in your relationships. Tiara's not here for the right reasons. Do you think that you talked to Jojo for the right reasons? It sort of seems like she's not here for the right reasons. I'm here for the right reasons, so. I'm and I'm here for the right reasons. Amanda acts like she's here for the right reasons. I'm here for the, for the right reasons, so. He is not here for the right reasons. I'm here for the right reasons. Ashley asks here for the right okay. reasons because I don't even know if she knows where here is. Now the phrase, person X isn't here for the right reasons, is ubiquitous to reality dating shows. But with Love Island, it's a very serious accusation. When there's a contestant who comes across as too aware that they're on a show, they're often punished in subtle ways. For example, Theo Campbell of season three doesn't appear to be particularly infatuated with any of the women, nor concerned about making a connection at all. Instead, his persona feels more aligned with the typical villain archetype of a regular reality show, and while his antics are incredibly entertaining, they feel out of sync with the easy naturalism of his fellow islanders. This comes to a head when he asks Tyla to take off her mic and join him in the pool, then proposing that the two of them pair up to beat out the competition. Tyla, horrified by this brazen Machiavellian display, immediately recants this encounter with the rest of the islanders, tainting Theo in the eyes of the women. He's booted out shortly after in a recoupling ceremony. This type of blatant strategizing is typical of gamified shows like Big Brother, but on Love Island, it's virtually unheard of. Instead, strategists on the show are so subtle that their game playing is left to the speculation of the public. For example, in season five, ballroom dancer Curtis Pritchard raised a significant amount of speculation that he was only using his partner Amy to win the cash prize. Much of this was a combination of he and Amy's bizarre pairing, as well as Curtis's milady type personality, which clashed with the himbo chad personalities typical to the show. But once he and Amy broke up and Curtis recoupled with fiery Irish ring girl Mora, a relationship he appeared much more comfortable in, the speculations started to die down and his spot on the show was much safer. On this most recent season, Jake Cornish drew controversy at the outset when he confided in a friend that he wasn't as attracted to his partner Liberty as he would like to be. From this moment on, people scrutinized Jake's every action. It grew to the point where his fellow islanders began to speculate his true intentions after public opinion started creeping into the villa. Unprecedentedly, his castmates' discussions about Jake's awareness of the camera were aired on TV. The accusations of game playing planted seeds of doubt into Liberty's mind, and the couple, who had been together since day one, broke up and voluntarily left the show very close to the finale. Here, Theo, Curtis, and Jake failed to adhere to the expectations of authenticity. Their presence on the show brought too great of an awareness to the surveillance apparatus, and Theo and Jake, who were unable to regulate their behavior accordingly, were punished for it. Reality shows, however much they attempt to seem truthful, rely upon narratives and storytelling devices to keep audiences glued to the screen. And like any classic story, Love Island has heroes and it has villains. We had Adam Collard in season four, Katie McDermott in season two, Theo in season three, and my favorite Islander of all time, Maura Higgins in season five, all of whom teetered a perfect line between quotability, chaos, and dating world ruthlessness. These people are the perfect reality show villains because they give us the entertainment we crave while remaining self-assured and even self-aware about the role they play. But then there are people who enter the villa with the intention of being a hero, whose lack of self-awareness or gradual deterioration begins to threaten the show's watchability. Niall Aslam, an original contestant of season four, conspicuously disappeared from the show on day nine, later revealing that he suffered a stress-induced psychosis and had to be admitted to a psychiatric hospital after leaving. Unbeknownst to the public and very known to the producers was that Niall had autism and was given virtually no assistance from the show to navigate life in the villa. He's since said that he was chosen to play the funny one of the cast, and with this expectation placed upon him, he felt the stress of having to perform at all times. Around the time of his departure, a note from the show's psychiatrist read, Please send me anything you want me to look at. If he does not settle in the next 24 hours, he's probably better out there, or will risk him becoming full-blown manic. Hopefully this can be done at the next boy exit. Tuesday? About his experience, Niall says, I was ITV's performing monkey, made to do things I didn't want to do. It ended in me being desperately ill. In season five, Amy Hart endured an incredibly painful and public breakup with her partner Curtis. 
Prior to this, the public reviled Amy for her apparent clinginess, entitlement towards Curtis, smugness about the stability of their relationship, and overall demeanor that fell short of what is expected of the women of Love Island. To viewers, Amy lacked self-awareness about the fact that she was on a dating show. Now, we can say what we want about Amy, but she's a person whose inexperience with dating made her incredibly vulnerable in these moments and ill-equipped to deal with the myriad of emotions that come with rejection. Paired with the fact that she was dumped on national television, these emotions would be amplified tenfold. So by the time it became clear that Curtis was potentially interested in Mora, a person thought to be a close friend in the villa, Amy was driven to her breaking point. And then, out of nowhere, her entire position on the situation changed overnight. Her new demeanor towards Curtis and Mora, and even her own journey on the show, caused fans to speculate about whether Amy had received some in-depth therapy session to help her cope with her feelings. As it turns out, she had sought help on 12 separate occasions during her time in the villa. And with this new outlook, Amy was able to realize that she would never be able to heal from her breakup with Curtis if she stayed on the show, and thus left voluntarily to the surprise of just about everyone. Similarly, as I discussed at the beginning of the video, Faye Winter of Season 7 experienced a major breakdown after watching an out-of-context clip of Teddy saying he was attracted to another woman. In the morning after her explosive outburst, Faye did not seem to be budging in her anger, but in the episodes that shortly followed, she appeared to be apologetic towards Teddy and reflective of her behavior. Now, I was unable to find evidence that suggests there was any sort of intervention on the part of the producers, but since we know that the show has onset psychologists, it's highly likely that Faye was taken aside and given some sort of discussion about her actions. As I've said, verbal rows are commonplace on Love Island, but Faye's behavior deviated far outside the norms of confrontation for the show. The argument was one-sided, the emotions only seemed to escalate, other islanders and Teddy himself looked quite bewildered, and it was clear that this could be fluctuating into the territory of a mental health episode. After her apology, she and Teddy went on to amass a relatively big fan base and managed to come in fourth in the series overall. What the cases of Niall, Amy, and Faye show us is that both the producers and the public have the power to crack down on behavior they perceive as deviant, and any neurodivergent person or person whose mental health falls outside the norm is seen as unable to appropriately regulate themselves under what is expected of them. They are either removed from the show, like Niall, voluntarily eject themselves from the villa, like Amy, or with guidance, regulate themselves accordingly, like Faye. Ultimately, contestants regulate themselves in accordance with a code of conduct that is accepted in the hyper-public sphere, one that's marketable enough to stay on TV, but not so entertaining as to elicit public abuse, to be outed as a game player, or to be perceived as socially deviant. And what we get is the kind of sanitized catharsis we're used to with other shows, where the romances are predictably forced and toxic, and contestants are now, for the most part, mannered and manicured. They perform hollow representations of what the show and the public expect them to be. Hot, dumb, and open to love. Amy Hart has since characterized the contestants of Love Island as hard workers who deserve a regulated and unionized industry, and she raises an interesting point. The Islanders used to laze about in bed, wander around the villa, and hang out like they were on vacation with friends. Now, they're all woken up at the same time with blinding fluorescent lights. They almost always convene in the garden area during the day, and they're only allowed two drinks at night. It's almost as if they're clocking into a job, and the show is capitalizing on the benefits of their labor. And if we're to conceptualize the Islanders as workers who willingly enter the villa, then we can also conceptualize Love Island's duty of care to the Islanders as a sort of corporate wellness strategy. It's almost as if the show, in its progression towards being more sanitized and nurturing, has started treating the villa as a workplace, providing its employees with an ethics of care and protection. But the expectation of self-monitoring and of self-preservation still lies mostly on the shoulders of the contestants. In applying these corporatized therapy programs, the producers shift attention away from the exploitative apparatus that's inherent to their show. In a short 1990 essay, philosopher Gilles Deleuze posited an update to Foucault's notion on the disciplinary society, of which the panopticon was conceived. He argues that we're shifting from a society of discipline to a society of control. In Foucault's society, we move between different physical enclosures – a prison, an office building, a school, a factory – which contribute to our self-discipline. But in the society of control, these barriers are broken down. We're encouraged to travel about, because all the information necessary to discipline us now lives in a database. 
the further we travel, the more information the database can collect from us. It's a society where, rather than being confined to a space where you never know if you're being watched, you're encouraged to embrace the fact that you're being watched everywhere. In fact, it's a privilege to be watched. Deleuze says, The disciplinary man was a discontinuous producer of energy, but the man of control is undulatory, in orbit, in a continuous network. Think of the home office, where we get the luxury of being in total comfort, while still being monitored by our employers through a screen. Think of the iPhone. We travel everywhere with it and tacitly give up personal information that we know is being harvested and sold to governments, but the society of control tells us not to care. What's insidious about this new society is that we're given the illusion of freedom, while being less free than we ever were before. The boundaries of Foucault's enclosure have broken down, and now we are always self-regulating. We are always working. Since 2015, social media's stranglehold over our everyday lives has become tighter with each passing year. You can see this in how the casting of Love Island has changed, with more and more influencers entering the show each season. Social media plays a central role in Love Island. Public opinion has the power to alter the show in real time through major forums like Twitter and Reddit. Many of the contestants are recruited through social media. And even if their primary job isn't to be an influencer, the everyday person is already used to refining themselves for the public eye via their personal Instagram or Facebook accounts. While it was almost tradition for former contestants of Love Island to get plastic surgery after leaving the show, more contestants than ever are entering the villa with their faces and bodies already modified, so much so that it was a major topic of conversation on this latest season. They've already altered themselves for a perceived public, in a world where the standards of beauty shrink every day with the unrealistic expectations set by social media. This is the greatest trick of the society of control. While the villa is a confined space where the panopticon can take shape, a workplace for the contestants to generate revenue, the society of control has made it so that contestants have clocked in on the project of self-regulation long before they entered the villa. And this is why I think Love Island, in its immense popularity and its myriad controversies, is so important. It's an instructional tool, a microcosm of a much greater, much more insidious system of surveillance that permeates our everyday lives. Love Island is a study in the society of control. It's an experiment in the way power becomes invisible and thus seeps into the facets of everyday life. It's a constant push and pull of market forces. The producers want to capitalize on the audience? Well, make all the contestants wear the same trendy Shein outfit each night, which consumers can buy straight from the app. The public is upset with how contestants are being manipulated? Well, they take to Ofcom and the show changes its tone. And the result has led Love Island down a path of hyper-commodification, subdued and obedient contestants, and ultimately towards becoming a show that looks nothing like the show we knew and love. The show is boring now, but wasn't that the true goal of the Panopticon all along? To placate its victims? And the worst part is, I can't necessarily say this is a bad thing. I mean, the show was more entertaining in its genesis, but maybe blandness is the price of contestant well-being. This is the catch-22 of reality TV. So maybe the fate of Love Island is a perfect case study in the ethics of using power and control for entertainment purposes. Maybe the trajectory of Love Island has predicted a trajectory for a greater social world. A world that's completely mappable, where people are easily tracked, and where each individual willingly adheres to the rules of the game. What that game is exactly, we have yet to find out. I'm so pleased to say that I'm working with Mubi again. Mubi is a curated streaming service with a team of curators that handpicks a movie from anywhere around the globe every single day. I'm not super risk-taking when it comes to finding new movies. That's why Mubi is so helpful. It exposes you to artful, thought-provoking, and innovative films you would never think to watch. Love Island is praised as a guilty pleasure which allows you to turn your brain off in the evenings, but it's not exactly known for its social commentary. If you're someone who's looking for a show or movie with a similar beachy atmosphere, but one that encourages you to question the world we're living in, then Treasure Island is the perfect film for you. This French documentary directed by Guillaume Braque takes an ethnographic look at a recreational site near Paris and its summer visitors. Many of these visitors don't have the means for, say, a luxury vacation in Mallorca, and therefore seek oasis in this little retreat. Brock's frames are picturesque, and he strikes a poignant commentary on the contradictions of immigration, poverty, and leisure. 
It's a beautiful film and just one of many that Mubi has to offer. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, there's always something new to discover. It's like your very own personal film festival, streaming anytime, anywhere. You can try Mubi free for 30 days at mubi.com slash broeydeschanel. That's M-U-B-I dot com slash broeydeschanel for a whole month of great cinema for free. Special thank you to Louis Osta, Syed Hassan, Malpertui, Cooper Stimson, Nina E, James Barcelona, Tenzing Mingmar, Jessica, Nadia C, Mark, and Greg Peter for supporting this channel.